How are you, people? If you're listening to this on Monday, tonight is one of the great comedy events of the year on Comedy Central, the roast of Justin Bieber. If anyone deserves a roast at such a young age, it's Justin Bieber. I'm sure you would probably want to roast Justin Bieber if you could. As always, there's a great mix of comedians like Jeff Ross, Hannibal Burris, and Natasha Leggero, and celebrity roasters like Snoop Dogg, Shaq, Martha Stewart, and Ludacris. The roast master this year is the amazing Kevin Hart, and some surprises, too. Check it out tonight on Comedy Central, or if you miss it, there will be a free uncensored version on the Comedy Central app. Dig it. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers, what the fuck buddies, what the fucking ears, what the fucksicles? How are you? I'm Mark Marin. This is WTF. Welcome to the show. Very excited today. Uh, Michael Imperioli, Christopher, is on the show. I, I don't know if he likes that, uh, but, <laughs> but that's what he's known for. God damn it, I miss the Sopranos. Do you ever sit down and just think to yourself, fuck, I miss the Sopranos? Like, back... What can you say back in the day? I don't know if it was back in the day, but when they were on, it was really the first kind of show of its kind where you just looked forward to it. It was like a craving. You're like Sunday nights, you'd lock in and just what, what's going to happen? I had no idea that was coming. That type of television, that sort of, I don't know if it's long form or serialized. I mean, that's there's nothing new about that, but just the fact that, like Breaking Bad that way too, that you enter every episode not knowing what the fuck is going to happen. And also the great characters and, and Michael Imperioli, uh, played, he played a great character on that and he was great in Goodfellas and he's great in his movie. He's great. He's a, he's a great guy and I was thrilled to talk to him because he's one of those guys, the character was so defined on the Sopranos where you think, I'm going to talk to that guy and he's not that guy. Uh, but it was great talking to him. It made me miss New York, you know, and I was just there. I didn't mention some stuff about uh, about New York. You know, I um, as I go back, you know, I finally got some good weather. I think I told you that, and uh, and I went down. I lived there a long time, and on a nice day in New York City, there's really nothing that compares to it. There's nothing like New York. There's no comparing any other city or place or or feeling. Uh, to New York because it is it is of itself and it is m- m- amazing, huge, spectacular, moving, the best city. And I was talking to some guy, a cab driver of all people, because that's what you do in New York, right? But we were just talking about it, uh, about how nothing feels like New York. You get in it, and when you're in it, you, you, you're filled with the energy of it. And if you know how to be there, it's 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 there's nothing more exciting just to walk in new york city on a beautiful day and i there was a couple of moments there you know i was walking and i was in between things i was there to to meet with people for a thing about a thing i had like two hours and i was just it, it was almost like fall weather and, and obviously i i went to joe's and i had the slice and uh, or two maybe three but don't you know what i mean i can i was on on a trip and uh I was wandering around, and I literally had nothing to do. I was like, why don't I have anything to do? I'm in New York. Isn't there somebody I need to see? Isn't there someplace I need to go? And I was like, no, man. You're just in New York. You're just here. So I went to a place that's near and dear to my heart. I went to uh, the to the secret meeting place at Perry Street and uh, went back in time to the early days of the the crazy clean time. Historical place, if you know what I'm talking about. Some of you do. If you don't, if you're in the uh, if you're in the secret society, be sure to go to Perry Street when you're in New York City. It's a classic. It's an institution. It's old timey, man. But uh, I was with my uh, my producer Brendan McDonald, my business partner in this endeavor, WTF, and uh, you know we were downtown, and we were at a meeting. We went to a, a meeting about a thing, and we were right there. Uh, at the World Trade Center, at the site and at the new building. I had not seen the new building. And I had not seen the memorial. And I was there that day. I was in Queens on my roof, uh, feeling uh, obliterated and, and in shock. 
And I don't think I'd been down to that site, certainly not since it had been under construction. And, and, and maybe, you know, I, I, I had gone down there weeks after the horror where it was just a, a, a smoking pile of, of steel, mangled steel that you couldn't really get close to, but you could see down the street. And I remember there was a lot of talk about what the memorial would be, what the new building would be, and and uh, everybody was ch- you know chiming in about this or that. So I had been re- really out of the loop because I had left New York. But I felt compelled, and I felt like I needed to go see the memorial. I had no idea what it was going to be like, what effect it would have, how it could be effective. And it's um, it was amazing. It's it's an amazing. Memorial, they, it's literally the the bottoms of the original towers. There's two of these pieces to this memorial, and and it's just a a, a giant square. It's a hole, and it, and it's a waterfall on all four sides. And then there's a pool at the bottom, and then another square hole that you just it's just darkness that you can't see the bottom of, and the water goes into it. All around the top are the names of the victims, and there are two of these. And they're massive, and they're quiet, and they're subtle, and they're profound, and they're moving. I didn't know how I would feel when I went down there. But to stand there and to, to have the reflection and to have you know, to honor the dead and, and, and honor the, the, the memory of what happened there and the ongoing sort of um, heartache of that. You don't, you don't really realize it, you know, that you have this heartache, this grief, until you check in. You check in with it. And there's something that was felt, obviously, around the world, but certainly if you lived in New York, it was a, a, a profound injury. And uh, as I stood there, I, I was like, you know, this they did this right, man. You know, I, I am moved. I am, I am thinking back. Uh, I am elevated. And it's uh, it was beautifully done. And it's something you should really see if in, you're in New York. Just, no matter what you think about what happened, it happened, and and people were killed that day, and it was uh, horrible, but to really pay respect was no easy trick, and I don't even know who designed this thing, but to use the space of the, of the, of the towers that were once there and, and why they're gone and what that represents and to integrate into that space a sense of, of living grief and respect for, for everyone who was lost there was no easy trick, no easy task. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, piece of, uh, living memorial art. And the new tower is nice. God be honest. I didn't go up in it, but uh, it's nice. It's hard to be there, but I'm glad I did. It d- it definitely had the effect of 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 bringing back something painful, of of integrating the grief and of of elevating the loss, and 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 sending it off. And gave us a little bit of closure there. It was uh, it was profound. I had no idea. I didn't know what to expect. You don't know how something like that's going to hit you. But obviously, you know, there were those of us who were there. And it was, yeah, well, everyone knows. It was, I'm not saying anything new. It was a tough day. But the memorial was spectacular. And I appreciate it. Also, a funny thing happened in uh, NYC. I thought it was a classic thing. I, I was in a coffee shop, uh, uh, having a coffee with Brendan, and I was walking out, and I knew some guy was looking at me like, he give me that look, that look where it's sort of like, yeah, I know who you are, and I, and I like you, but I'm trying to be cool. Happens. I've had that look for others. I'm familiar with the look from within and without. And I'm walking out, and he looks at me, and, goes, and I look at him, and, he, and I'm like, hey, what's up, buddy? He goes, hey, hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Uh, yeah, big fan. I'm a big fan. And he, his brain got a little jangled there in the moment. And uh, I was saying, well, well, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, nice meeting you. I asked him his name. I don't remember it now. I'm, I'm sorry. He told me his name, and I'm walking out. And he goes, hey, hey, k- keep up the good luck. I mean, work. Keep up the good Oh, boy, I screwed it up. 
but keep up the good luck. That was a beautiful mistake. It was one of the greatest things I ever heard. I'm walking out. I'm like, dude, that's a that's that's a shirt. That's what that is. Keep up the good luck. I'm gonna try, man. I've been trying all my life. Finally got a little a little run of it. But Jesus, folk, keep up the good luck if you can. If you got a run going, keep up the good luck. All right, what else is happening, man? Pull it together, man. Oh, look at my calendar. Look at that. It looks like baseball season starts in a week. Is that possible? I actually have it circled on the calendar because it's pretty important to me. <laughs> I know that this might surprise you because you know how big a baseball fan I am, but I but I didn't get a chance to join Fantasy Baseball League this year. A shocker, I know, and with the season almost underway, I really missed my chance. Maybe some of, uh, of you missed your chance, too, unless you're planning to use DraftKings. At DraftKings.com, you can win huge cash prizes every day just by playing Fantasy Baseball. There are new teams to play at DraftKings every day, which means no season-long commitments, and you don't have to worry about injuries. You just pick two pitchers, eight position players, and stay under the salary cap and you're good to go people it's like a new season every day and you can win instant cash prizes hundreds of thousands of players have already won and DraftKings has paid out some serious bills like millions of them hurry to DraftKings.com now and use the promo code WTF to play for free in the $100,000 fantasy baseball contest on opening day first place takes home 10 grand for playing fake baseball Use the promo code WTF for free entry now at DraftKings.com. Before I forget, I don't know if they're sold out or not, uh, but I'm going to do a couple of warm-up shows at the Trippany House here in L.A. Uh, tomorrow night, Tuesday, March 31st, and uh, next Monday, uh, I guess April 6th. Uh, trippinghouse.org. I, I don't know if they're sold out. This might be, I might be misleading you, but I wouldn't be misleading you if I told you that the tour commences very soon. Uh, and I should probably go over that real quick, if you don't mind, because things are, are selling and some things have changed a bit. Not, not changed in any way, but some shows have been added. Maybe you should. There are still tickets for the Warner Theater in Washington, D.C. That's Thursday, April 9th. At the Trocadero in Philadelphia, both shows are sold out, I believe. At the Wilbur in Boston, Mass., uh, they added a second show. I believe there's still tickets for that. That's Saturday, April 11th. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin, the Barrymore Theater. You can still get tickets for that. April 17th in Pittsburgh, Carnegie of Homestead Music Hall. Still a few tickets for that left. Royal Oak Music Theater in Royal Oak, Michigan. Outside Detroit, still a few tickets. Uh, they added a second show in Toronto. First show is sold out. The late show, don't know, but you can try. The Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas, don't know where that's at, but uh, get tickets. Fitzgerald's in, uh, Fitzgerald's in Houston on April 25th, sold out. Uh, April 23rd is the Paramount Theater Day in Austin. April 26th, Southside Music Hall in Dallas, still tickets. Friday, May 8th, the Neptune's Theater early show, sold out. They added a late show, don't know where it's at. Vancouver, the Vogue on May 9th, still tickets. May 10th in Davies Symphony, Davies Symphony Hall, San Francisco, definitely still tickets. Big place. May 14th, the Orange Peel, Asheville, North Carolina. Early show sold out, second show was added. May 15th, Charleston Music Hall in Charleston, South Carolina, I believe there's still tickets. May 16th, Variety Playhouse, Atlanta, Georgia, still tickets. May 17th, Joy Theater, New Orleans, still tickets. There you go. There's the update. Okay? Uh, I'll see you on tour if you're coming. Please come. I clean the garage, man. I do it. I don't need, I'd like to say I do it yearly, but I hadn't done it in a while, and I had to throw out a lot of stuff, move some stuff out, vacuum. Where does the dust come from? I don't even have the window open here. What is dissolving? What is eroding? What is coming apart that causes so much dust? Is it just from me? Am I emanating dust? Do the guess? I was. It got to the point here. Well, obviously, I've been in production a lot, and you know, some of you have figured out that sometimes we record interviews and we don't um, put them up right away. But now it's like we got to get back on it. And I was sitting in my garage. I'm like, I'm a little ashamed of this mess. And uh, it no longer has the kind of cluttered charm that uh, the garage once had. Now it just looks cluttered. There's just stacks of shit everywhere. There's chaos. There's a mess. There's garbage. There's dust. And now I got it. Yeah, I cleaned it up. Can breathe in here. And now it's time to start entertaining people again. More frequently, with pride in my cluttered shithole of a garage. Looks good, though. Looks good. I feel all right about it. Found some interesting stuff. 
uh, it's weird when you do the cleaning. Because like, I was like, I got to do it. I set my mind to it. But then you end up just just watching your life slowly pass before your eyes as you go through piles and boxes. You know, looking at my high school diploma. <laughs> Looking at stuff I wrote 10 years ago. Got a stack of fucking, like, uh, week at a glances from 2001, 1999. What? I don't even know why I kept those. I think you had to keep them at some point for tax reasons. Just looking at my schedule. That was sort of weird. Underneath an amplifier in here, like a little amp, that's flush with the ground. It's flush with the floor of the garage. I picked it up, and there was a fully preserved lizard skin. A lizard had shed his skin under there perfectly, and I don't know how it got under there, because it was almost pressed. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know if it was magic, but I do know that uh, a lizard shed his skin perfectly beneath an amplifier in my garage. And uh, I've tried to do that. I can only aspire to the perfectly shed skin. It's stamps.com time, people, and they're sponsoring a little trivia question on this show. The question is, when is the best time to go to the post office? What do you think? After work? How about during lunch? No, before work. It's before work, right? Wrong. There's no best time to go to the post office because there's stamps.com, people. Stamps.com made it so you never have to go to the post office again. With Stamps.com, access all the services of the post office right from your desk. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter or package using your computer and printer. Then just hand it to your mail carrier, and that's it, people. It's magic. And unlike the post office, Stamps.com is open 24-7 with no lines, so you can get your mailing and shipping done whenever it's convenient for you. Stamps.com is only fifteen ninety nine a month. That's it, folks. No long-term multi-year commitments like those postage meters require. No markups on postage. In fact... You'll even get special postage discounts with Stamps.com, so it's really a no-brainer. That's why I use it. It just makes sense. Right now, use my promo code WTF for this special offer. Start a no-risk trial, plus get a $110 bonus offer that includes a digital scale and up to $55 of free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on that microphone at the top of the home page and type in WTF. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. We were just using it in here. Just now, Ashley was in here. Mail-in posters, printing out those stamps.com labels. And your posters are coming. Relax. Right now, let's enjoy my uh, my conversation with Michael Imperioli. Spectacular. Great guy. You're just gonna, I mean, if you're a fan, you're just going to love hearing his voice. I just loved listening to him for, for as long as we talked. All right, here we go. It's weird. I don't know. I guess I associate you with New York in my head. Oh, I was there forever till two years ago. Yeah? Are you happy about it? You, <laughs> know, you don't seem thrilled. No. No, no, I'm very happy. I know. I, it was time for me to change. Yeah? yeah. Where'd you go? Santa Barbara. Right. <laughs> so, like, why Santa Barbara? I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to live in a big city anymore. Yeah? That was the thing. So yeah. I was, and... I mean, New York is the greatest city in the world, and if you, but if you don't want to live in a big city... You can't live there, right? So well, you, well, you could have went upstate. Really, I'm not really crazy about the suburbs in New York. No, but no, but further up, like the the country, the Hudson Valley. Well, I wanted something different. We were ready for something different. Do you live by the I. beach? Oh, uh, about a mile and a half. Well, that's not bad. How long of a drive is that? Uh, an hour and a half. Well, thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> just, it's weird because you know you're one of those guys that I feel like I've seen all my life. I feel familiar with you, uh -huh. but of course I'm not. No, because... I feel the same about you. I'm, I'm, Is that we're true? Not, we're not f familiar with each other at all. But no, we feel yeah. like we are. But in reality, we're not, right? Uh, well, no, I don't know. I guess not. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I, uh, because I, it's hard when you do a, a role like you did on The Sopranos for as long as you did it. Yeah. For people not to have this fucking relationship with you. Of course. And then, like, even, you know, when you played Spider and all that stuff. Like, when I was, you know, younger. I feel like I was younger when I saw you. How old are you? Uh, almost 49. All right, so I'm 51. Not that big a difference. Right. But, I mean, I imagine that people come up to you all the time, and they're like, hey, what's up? All the time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. It's never going to go away. I don't, probably not. <laughs> I fucking miss that show, buddy. Do you? It was a lot of fun. Um, You know, I, 
I miss the camaraderie. We had a, you know, I knew a lot of those guys even before The Sopranos. Yeah. From other jobs. Yeah. Some of them from acting school. Who? From a, I knew John Ventimiglia, who played the chef, Artie Bucco. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I He's met in him. your movie. He was in my I met him when I was 17 uh, in acting school. And we were roommates. And then Sharon Angela, who's also in the, my movie. Uh, She's great. The Hungry Ghost. We went to act. I know her since I was 19. Really? How old were you? She, uh, what are you, around the same age? It's hard for me to yeah, get ages. Yeah. yeah, but we, you know, some of those people in my class started working together in indie film and in theater, and we started a company together. What school was it? It was an offshoot of Lee Strasberg Institute. It was a woman named Elaine Aiken who started her own studio. Uh-huh. Alec Baldwin was in that class for a while. Yeah. Um, so it was one of those was ones where we, everyone kind of gravitated around the personality of that woman, whoever that was. Yeah. What's her name? Elaine Aiken. Yeah, she died a number of years ago, but she uh -huh. was a great teacher. So you were part of that whole sort of New York acting thing, like going through Yeah, we did that. I took some classes with Stella Adler. You did? Yeah, who I was, was Brando's teacher. Right. She was still alive. I took some classes with her. Well, how old were you? Uh, 17. Yeah? Uh, and you just had to do that, right? I just uh, said... You know, I finished high school and like, yeah. what do you? I, I wound up not going to college. Yeah, I kind of bailed. Yeah, the night before I was supposed to leave in September, and just said I, I was going to go upstate to Albany, and, and I was like, state school to SUNY, SUNY, and then yeah. I was like, you know, I, I want to be in the city. I want to be an actor, and and that's what I did. But um, you know, my teacher was really cool because she was like, you know, look, you don't have to go to college, but. If you want to be an actor and you want to be an artist, you have to really educate yourself and you have right. to learn about art. And this was Elaine? About painting and music and she told literature. You that? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I went to museums with her and she turned me on to books and. One on one? Sometimes, yeah. So this woman who was what, in her 70s? By then, she was probably in her late 60s, is, maybe early 70s. Is taking you around, the 17, 18 year old kid? Yeah. To the Museum great. of Modern Art and stuff? To the Met. She was very generous, you know, that way. And very, um, you know, another kid who was in that class, a guy named Tom Gilroy, who's now a writer director. He just had a movie called The Cold Lands that came out, and he directed a movie called Spring Forward a number of years ago. Uh huh. And he was an actor then, and we started, he started. We produced a Arthur Miller play called Incident at Vichy that Tom directed and I produced back in 88. I was like, started producing when I was in my early 20s. Yeah. And he started directing, then he started writing, so we started producing his stuff. And a lot of the people who were in my movie were way back in the 80s we were doing this stuff. Well, no, it's interesting to me. It's also yeah. interesting how, you, like, when she would take you to museums and stuff, what did, what did you learn? What did you put together at that time? Because where did you grow up? I grew up right outside of the city in Mount Vernon, New York. And what what were you, what was your family like? What did your old man do? He was a bus driver in the Bronx. Really? Oh, uh, for for thirty years. Yeah. So he's a uh, government job, right? City job. City yeah. job. MTA. Got his pension. Retired. Uh huh. That's what he was gunning for the whole way, right? Semi retired. He still works, but he's re he gets a pension. Too. What's he do? He drives uh, a couple of doctors. Oh, per like uh, in the car. Yeah, it's pretty mellow. They, okay, they yeah. treat him really well. So. And your mom? My mom's retired. She was in the school. She worked in a public school. So what'd she do? Teaching or? No, a secretary. And so you grew up working class, New York. Yeah. Italian? Yeah. Very? Yeah. Italian, you know, third generation. Right. But um, very much that was my neighborhood and friends and yeah. that stuff. Catholic? Yeah. Food? Lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> Good food. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, you won the, the chop thing. You know, I was obsessed with chop for a long time. I won the celebrity competition. I had, you know, I've had uh, Conant on here, Scott Conant. Uh -huh. And I've had. Uh, I didn't, he wasn't on my episode. But. I've had, uh, you know, what's her name? Alex Gernicelli. She was one of my judges. She's yeah. tough, man. She was good to me, though. Yeah. <laughs> she was really good to me. <laughs> Who were you up against? Uh, I was up. The finalist was uh, Brandy Chastain, who mm -hmm. was the. The Olympic women's soccer team. Yeah. She was the chick who took off her shirt and then was wearing a sports bra, that famous picture. She was a, the final. It was me and her in the Was final. she good? She was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Where'd you learn how to cook? You know, I worked in restaurants for many, many years in all aspects of the business. And I learned a little bit there, but then I, I really learned from doing it because my wife doesn't cook. So when we started having kids... I we used to get takeout in New York from every restaurant because yeah, yeah. we were always on the go, and I started hating every. I got just got sick of everything. Stack of menus. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted home food, yeah. so I started learning stuff that I liked, and you know, still just keep. After you know, eighteen years of doing it, you start. 
you got a knack for getting it. good, yeah. Yeah, but you know, you gotta have a feel for it. Do you yeah, well, I like to eat. So yeah. you like to eat, but yeah. some people can't fucking do it. They can't cook. They just can't get it. Yeah, it takes a little. I guess you have to have a little knack. You gotta like. I think the the key is like. Uh, you have to be able to conceive, conce- conceptualize what you're cooking. That's exactly right. Yeah. You got to see yeah. the end. You got to see the end and you get inspired by an ingredient. Yeah. You know, like where I live, they have a great farmer's market on the weekend. You yeah. go and you see what's in season, what looks good. And then you're like, oh, I can make this. Yeah. With this. and You love you know, it, right? Oh, it's nice. Yeah. It's All right. Really so back to the museum. So you're, in, go, you're hanging around with this acting teacher. What's her name again? Elaine? Elaine Aiken. Yeah. Famous. I think John, John Ventimiglia and I went with her when they had a... I remember in the late '80s they had a uh, the Hermitage in in Russia. They sent this big collection yeah. over of a lot of the big impressionists like yeah. Van Gogh and Picasso and stuff, but stuff that had never been seen mm-hmm. in the West, you know, for a long time. I don't think the uh, I don't, uh, it was probably right bef- before, still before the wall came down. Yeah, but somehow they had this exchange, so we went to see these paintings, and it, and it really made a big. It was the first time I kind of understood what an artist did, you know, like yeah. what. Well, what is he doing? What, he's not just painting what he sees. He's painting. He's interpreting what he sees through his emotion. That day, I really kind of clicked. Sunk in. Right. Yeah. So exactly what she wanted you to know about art. Yeah, there was a painting by Van Gogh called Rain. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it since, but it was very abstract. And yeah. It was, you know, it was his thing of the rain. And then it kind of clicked. Oh yeah, for me at least at that point. It's I was a good a moment, kid. right? It was a big moment, yeah. But you know, I remember that, and sure. it really instilled, uh, you know, a, con- a, a, a conceptual notion of what an artist does or can do. And she gave me that. That's uh-huh. very big that for a teacher to instill in a student. You know. Well, it's it's interesting that she knew innately, you know, as somebody who's teaching creative people how to act, that you need to know about these other things. Yes. You know, you need yeah. to. You know, if you're not going to go to college, you need to broaden your right. Your thing. Right. She wasn't, she never said you need to get good headshots. She, right. She was totally unconcerned with the whatever methods of getting work. She never spoke about agents. She never spoke about auditions or anything like that. She was all about the craft. And, and that was it. And what, do you still use her principles or ideas? Yeah, all the time. I do because it's, she would, the thing I took most from her is a way of creating privacy. Uh huh. You know, in the in the on the set, right? Really, uh-huh. so you can be free to express yourself without in- inhibitions. Well, and now that that was an idea she showed you guys. Well, through technique, through you know, um, they use sense memory. Uh-huh. They, you know, there was this one exercise called private moment, which basically you you create, say. You know, Mark, you're going to create how you feel in this because you like being in the studio. You get inspired in the yeah. studio. You create here. Yeah. So you imagine, okay, here's the walls. Here's the yeah. shelves. Here's yeah. the books. And then you infuse that with whatever scene you're doing. Okay. And hope, you know, and and I can use that because sometimes, you know, you're, you're shooting on the street and there's people watching and there's helicopters and right. there's noise and there's people yelling and let's go, let's go. You need to find a way to center yourself, to concentrate, to focus in these things. And that's one way that really works for me. And that's something that she, she taught us. She, she really, that was a big exercise for her. Yeah. And I noticed, you know, in your movie, which I watched yesterday, which it's been a few years, right? We shot that in 2008. And where is it at now? You can just get it. It's available on well, Netflix. Well, it was on Netflix for a long time. I don't know if it's still there. It was there for a long time. Um, it's called The Hungry Ghost. So yeah. I don't know if it, the website, if you can order it there. Virgil Films is the distributor. You could probably order it from them. Were you happy with that movie? Oh, yeah. How long did it take you to make that? 25 days. Yeah. And you wrote the whole thing. Yeah. And directed the whole thing. You have yeah. a little bit of a cameo in there. No. Right? You're not in it at all? No. Oh, I thought you were the cop. You're not the cop? That's my brother. Hey, look, I would say, I look at him, I was like, geez, he put on weight. What? That's <laughs> my, my younger brother, yeah. He yeah, yeah. Oh, he's the my cop? My father was the guy who... Picks uh, Steve up in the car service in the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I thought it was a very uh, uh, engaging movie. It was uh, a little disturbing. Yeah, and it, it took on all the big questions. But I I noticed that everyone was acting their balls off. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that like these were you know because I didn't know a lot of those people. I know the kid. I saw him in the in the uh, the movie with, uh, with Ryan Gosling. Yeah. yeah, I think this was his first movie. Like, how old was he? He was 18. I didn't know him. He w- that was pretty much the only part that we auditioned people. Pretty much everyone else in that movie, that the parts were written for them. 
my wife and I had a theater that we built in New York. We had we produced new plays for a number of years. I remember that. What was it called? Studio Dante. Yeah. And about eighteen or nineteen of those. Actors were either in productions or in the class. We had classes there. We taught acting. You taught? Yeah. I taught Sharon, Angela, uh, Vince Curatolo, who played Johnny Sack, and Nick Sandow, mm-hmm. who is now on uh, Orange is the New Black. He's another, yeah. the other lead in the movie. Yeah. Four of us taught at the school, at the theater. But mostly we produced new plays. Uh-huh. Yeah. Shrip I know from comedy. He used to book a room at the Trop. Did you work the room there? No. Did you? No, I never worked there. Right. But I, 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 I remember his name, and I remember him being around. But you, you uh, did, I never did you stand up in Vegas? Not much. I don't. I wanted to bring my son tonight because he's a, he's a stand up comedian. Is he? Yeah, he's seven. He just turned seventeen Saturday. Uh huh. And the last year he's been performing on uh, in clubs. Oh yeah. And I don't know classes. if I've met him. No, you've never met him. But he, I, you know, he's he's in junior in high school, so he had. A lot of projects, but he couldn't make it down. But he was, he kind of was the one who said, "You have to do this, uh, <laughs> this show," because he has a book that you wrote that I got him, and he's oh the my my book yeah oh that's he's the, a very big fan of yours. That's very nice. What that's done. what got that's what landed you. Uh, that's how I, he kind of sealed the deal. You know, he was like because he, he, he's a big admirer of yours. So. Well, that's a very sweet. What's yeah. his name? Vadim. Vadim. Yeah, that's a uh, where'd you get that's that? A Russian. Name? My wife is uh, Russian. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's very uh that's exciting, man. Well, I wish him the best of luck. How's he doing? Is he funny? He's funny, man. He uh he writes his own stuff. He's he's uh he's good. He performed once in LA at the John Lovitz Club at yeah. Universal City. Oh my Hall. god, that's so that was a, not a, it was a good a good experience for him because oh, he was with you know, real comics. Yeah, it was a, it was like a It's Tuesday just a weird night. location. Yeah, it's not a destination. It's yeah, yeah. people who are going on their way. But this, the, the staff there is great. They're really good people. Oh, but, and he's done a bunch of clubs in Santa Barbara. He opened for uh, Lee Camp. Do you uh-huh. know him? He yeah. opened for him. He opened for Yakov Shmirnov. Yakov, <laughs> and, I had uh, Yakov in here. Yeah, but team opened for him once in Santa Barbara. And a um, couple of the pretty good comments. So what's he got, like 20 minutes? 15, 15 10, 15. 10. 15. That's great, man. How do you feel about your kid going into the arts? It's... I mean, that's scary watching him. I mean, 10 o'clock on a Saturday, there's a room full of drunk people. You know, he looks really young. He's uh-huh. 17, but he looks even younger. So uh-huh. He gets on stage, and then it's pretty frightening, you know. But like, but in but terms of, like, do you, are you concerned for the, the struggle of entering show business? I, you know, I think today everything's a struggle. I mean, what isn't a struggle? I mean, uh, yeah. it's... You know, he's going to have to support himself doing other things anyway, so right. it's it's not unlike any other job, it seems. But well, That's a good way to look at it. People are going to do what they're, you know, destined What's, to do and what they would, would hopefully... If, they're, if they feel the courage, yeah, and the support. Yeah, he has a really good teacher in Santa Barbara named Louise Palanker. Um, a stand-up teacher? Yeah. Really? Yeah, she, she runs a teen... That's how he got into it. She runs a teen comedy class in Santa Barbara. Uh-huh. And, uh... He was kind of doing class clown stuff and getting in class clown trouble in school. Right. And I found this class. I said, you're going to go. Uh, you suggested it? He said, no, I don't want to do this. And the first time he went, he goes, that's the greatest thing I've ever done. And now he's hooked. <laughs> yeah. I suggested it to challenge his, really? his energy. Yeah. That's that's great. And and and, and now Louise, stuck. Louise is a great, she's been a great And mentor. now you've got a comic in the family. And i got a comic in the family. You know? And what are the other kids? How old are they? Is he the oldest? He's in the middle. I have a daughter who's tw- who's twenty four, who's uh, into photography. She's in school in New York at SUNY Purchase. Shooting, shooting, and art management now. Really, she's getting into studying that. And then I have a thirteen year old boy who's uh, into guitar. Yeah, yeah? all yeah. artists, all in yeah, the arts. All in the arts. Yeah, you play guitar, right? I do. Yeah, you good? <laughs> 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 that, yeah, that's very. Yeah. <laughs> what you know what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, I play. I play in a band. I mean, I, I mean, I read about that. I couldn't. I didn't. I didn't. I couldn't find a record though. The soundtrack was uh, was the, a great well, soundtrack. The opening. The opening instrumental is it's is, you? Uh, is my band is uh, a Zopa and the but the a lot of the singer that you hear the singer songwriter stuff that was a. Uh, Elijah Amatun, who plays in my band, he plays bass, but he writes his own music, and he scored a lot of that original. It stuff. sounded great. Yeah, he did a lot of that for the. Yeah, movie. some of it sounded kind of stonesy. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, and then the band stuff, like the opening instrumental, is is our band, but he did his own stuff for the score. Was that the original dream, or was it the side dream? 
rock and roll, you know, when, playing music. Uh, you know, acting kind of was the first thing I went into. But yeah. I started playing uh, in in bands pretty much at the same time. Yeah. And I played guitar in one band, and then I started singing with another band. Right when I started working as an actor, and I couldn't do both at the same time right. at that point in my life. So, you know, I was, you know, uh, the one band I was in, I was singing. It was a uh, drummer and a guitar player. And they went on, they, you know, after I left, they got this woman, um, Brenda Souter, who was in the Feelies. Oh, you know that band? Yeah, 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 yeah. And sh they formed a band called Wild Carnation out of that. Some of the music that they that we wrote they went on and did other versions of yeah. without my lyrics uh-huh they do all right yeah really good but it, so i so I, I that was something you know in the 80s in new york a lot of people were doing a lot of different things it yeah. wasn't uncommon for artists to you know basquiat had a band that he played in a band with vincent gallo you know, <laughs> Vincent Gallo well, Vincent a Valgo was a painter when yeah. he started, before yeah. he was an actor. Are you friends with him? I met him once on the street. We ran into each other and had about a two-hour conversation Yeah, on the Bleecker Street. That was that the only was time we ever met. Yeah, I think he lives... I don't wonder if he lives here. He, he's, a, he's an interesting guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious talented. about that guy. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. I don't know what he's up yeah. to. He's very talented. Yeah, he's a little scary to me. <laughs> Some people think that. I guess. <laughs> yeah, he's just one of those guys where he, he strikes me as a guy. It's like I don't know if he's fucking with me or not. No, I feel we, like... we had a very. It was it was one of those times you just all of a sudden you stop what you're doing and have this two hour conversation Great. with someone you never met. It was very yeah, it was really interesting. Well, New York in the eighties. I was there in eighty nine. You know, that's when I got there, and it no. was sort of like there was still that that feeling of, of vitality to Lower East Side art scene, and, yes. and what was left of performance art was sort of still yeah. around. It was right before it all kind of went away and mm -hmm. became something else. It seemed like a very exciting place it to live. It was very exciting. It when were you great. there? Like what? Eighty three. Oh, so that was like the middle of Fantastic. it. Fantastic. And you were like what seventeen? Seventeen. Yeah. Oh, it's like Oz. Yeah. Yeah. You know, not the TV show. Yeah. The movie. Every, everything <laughs> was still like happening. It was. It was very exciting. Parties and stuff. Mm -hmm. And did you know Basquiat? No, I didn't know. I knew um, uh, some of the people from that scene a, year, a couple of years later, like Kenny Scharf. Uh -huh. and Debbie Debbie Mazar was part of that scene, and uh, Joey Arias and those people. Yeah, it was exciting. God damn, man! Well, I know, like watching your movie, like if you wrote that, if that came out of you, you had to fight with something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of people had you know a lot of people in my circle. That's that movie came out of a place of you know spiritual searching and addiction uh, seeing a lot of addiction around me yeah a lot of uh, you know and and what started out as kind of part of the scene and kind of you know casual and part of the lifestyle and and then over time you see it start to just destroy people it's know? horrible yeah yeah people get strung out can't stop Lose the yeah, life. and they rely on it, and you know it's it goes from being, you know, something that's that's part of your youth to part, something that's killing you. Yeah, you saw a lot of that. Yeah, well, that movie, like they're struggling with uh, you know spiritual elements, you know, and and to be the lead character was an interesting character. It reminded me a little of the movie, like it's a hard role to play. You know, the the guy that is you know sort of demonically possessed with the truth, and it's existentially sort of. Or well, what he thinks is the truth, right? Yeah, but but he's he. It's all a, a negation. Yes, that's what it became. It started out. He probably started out with very good intentions and yeah. had a lot of artistic am, a, a, sensibilities and ambitions, but never quite fulfilled them. And you know, had had was a seeker, a spiritual seeker. Yeah. You know, maybe read, and then that stuff started to turn on itself when he couldn't. Basically, he couldn't let go of his ego he, he right he wanted it on his own terms you know he kind of was almost too smart for his own good right and and he understood things in a very literal intellectual way but he was never able to really integrate those things into true compassionate action you know he takes this guy this he he, he does he takes this homeless guy in but he starts out with very different intent he kind of does it as this kind of Karawaki and kind of beat right. on the road where I'm hanging with this guy right. we're drinking in the park and yeah. then he kind of feels responsible he gets a motel room he puts this guy up and this guy kind of you know starts to treat him like shit you know and, and shit's all over himself and he has to clean it up and you don't see it 
but, but know, was, I spared the viewers all that stuff. But, but, but I thought that was an interesting moment because what's that guy going to do? And the fact that he cleaned him up, right. you know, was you know was sort of an interesting moment. Right. That he made that choice. Right. Could have split. Yeah. It um, it kind of was based on it was based on a real life experience actually. When we my wife and I owned a bar for a while. Yeah. I've never actually told anybody this that that it was based on this. What happened was. There's a guy who was drinking in the bar, got really drunk, yeah. passed out. Yeah. So we kind of figure, all right, let him sleep it off. Now it's 4 o'clock in the morning. We're cleaning up. The guy's still passed out. So yeah. we wake the guy up. Turns out he's on leave or AWOL or something from the military. Yeah. And doesn't know where he's staying. This is with bars in Chelsea. Doesn't know where he's staying in New York. His ID says Arizona. I call his father in Arizona. His father doesn't know anything, doesn't know where he's staying, doesn't know if he's with the army or not. And he guy was an asshole. Yeah. The guy was an you know, just degrading women, cursing at other customers, nasty to me, you know, fuck you and well, I'm I'm sorry. It's, no, you can that. cuss here. You can't. Okay. Yeah. Um But now we you know, he passes out, now he wakes up, I don't know what to do with him, so I put him in a cab. I get in a cab with him. Is he still shit faced? Shit faced, out yeah. of his mind. Doesn't know where he is. Yeah. Uh, we go to this hotel on the west side that I know is like a flop house and cheap place because mm -hmm. you know I didn't have I didn't have a lot of money on me then or whatever. Yeah. I get him a room. It was like fifty bucks. Bring him now. I gotta get him up the the stairs, <laughs> and he starts cursing at people, and I start yelling at him, pretending I'm like his sergeant. Yeah, I'm like, you're a soldier. Your job is to protect the people, not to abuse the people. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, you're right, and put him in bed. That was you. you took that role. Five dollars on his yeah, the nightstand. Yeah, and then closed the door, and then just left. Right, and. You know, a lot of people. Well, why are you going to do that? You know, the guy's an asshole. You should just. But if if I left him on the street, he probably would. Someone would have kicked his head in or something because yeah. he was rolled him, whatever. Yeah, or he would have started mouthing off to the wrong person. Right. But um, you know, so when I was writing the script, I kind of thought of that thing, and it's like when you just when you take that step to kind of help somebody, just because you feel a little bit, you know, the, yeah. he was young. He was probably twenty one, yeah. twenty two. Right. He was got drunk in my place. Now I feel kind of responsible. Right. <laughs> I didn't know what else to do. I'm not gonna take him to my house. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah, uh, you know asshole. I had kids and the guy. Yeah. Who knows what he's yeah, gonna yeah. do? Right. Um, but you felt like you, you wanted to take care. I of didn't him. have the heart to leave the guy on the street. Right. Which was the only other option. He didn't know where to go. He had a hotel key with no name of the hotel on it. You know what I mean? It was just like. So maybe he'll figure it out the next day. That's what your thought was. He's going to figure something out the next day when he's sober. At <laughs> yeah, least he'll know he'll know where the hell he is. But what were you saying about when you start to get involved, when you do something compassionate? There's a there's a moment what where you well where, where you know where you're you're opening yourself to. It's not necessarily going to go the way you're not going to get reward. I mean, the guy like abused me the whole time, right. pretty much. Mm -hmm. Cursed at me. Oh, attacked me at one point. Yeah, when we got out of the cab. Started, you know, went at me, and and that's uh, I just remembered that I left that part out of the story. Literally attacked me, and when I and I had to kind of calm him down again. But you take that step, and it doesn't just because you're acting out of a you're trying to be a nice guy doesn't right. mean that it's going to go the way you want, and they're right. going to understand that you're being nice, nor or, or appreciate it. Right? right, right. That's where that scene came out of. It's well, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it didn't. It's not the same scene. No, no, no. But, but it but, was inspired. But by the that. idea of selflessness. Let's say, because right. it was. I think I'm looking back on myself saying it was kind of a bullshit, altruistic act in my mind. I think I was kind of. I don't know. I mean, maybe in some in some respects. Well, no, you took care of the guy. Yeah, I, I mean, felt I, kind of responsible. Right. Well, I mean, so but I, I probably maybe... shouldn't have served him all those. I didn't serve him. Someone else did. But we probably should have been a little more careful <laughs> on how much the guy was drinking when we were, you know, That's you right. know. So it wasn't completely altruistic. You he, wanted to clear your conscience. He, he was. Yes. Right. Probably. Yeah. Well, no, well, that's still good. I never heard so. back from the guy. Never heard back. Well, I didn't leave him my information, but he, I don't even think he probably remembered where he was. I don't know how he got there. I think he got there with people, but at some point he was alone. He didn't remember who he was with. I mean, it was, I mean, imagine waking up in this hotel. Then, then I thought, God, imagine he's going to wake up in that hotel room, hungover. Yeah. 
He's not going to know where the hell he is. Yeah. Even when he walks out, he's not going to know where he is. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna. It's gonna. He had no money on him. Exciting day for him. Exciting day. Trying to figure <laughs> out how to get back. But with all that, with, did you find that with that screen that script? Because you know, it's nicely shot. It's beautifully put together. It's a. It's a big undertaking. That movie. Mm. It's funny because I noticed you were shooting at Gimme Gimme Records, and and they he, have one. I just saw it's it here. him. It's the same guy. He moved here. He was a friend of the producer. And yeah, he Dan. Let us have, he let us have... I've shot there on my TV show. I, I drove by and I was like, God, that's the place. I texted him last night. I said, looking at your old store. Yeah. Yeah, same guy. And we got posters from... Rob, Robert Pollard gave us some posters. Oh, from uh, yeah, and, Guided by Voices? And, and, and Lou Reed gave us a poster to use for the... For the movie. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I had to reach out for my TV show. I got to reach out to everybody. You can't fucking everything. You can't put you anything gotta, up. You, yeah. You Did can. you know Lou Reed? Yeah, he came to this when we uh, screened it in New York. He came to see it, which w was a big deal for me. I get, you know, he, Lou is my hero, basically. Yeah. Out of anybody. God, I fucking love him. And uh, I just bought a second copy of The Blue uh, Mask yesterday. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he performed in 2000. He did the, the Ecstasy album, and he was he did a tour, and he played at the Knitting Factory in Tribeca. So yeah. I called my manager. I said, listen, could you get... Because uh, the show was on the air, so at that then I, I was able to like get tickets sometimes. I said, can you get tickets for Lou Reed? She said, okay, because it was sold out. She got me tickets. Um, the show was over. And my wife and I was about to leave, and someone came and said, Lou wants to meet you. And I was like, Lou Just wants out of to nowhere? Well, I guess they got the tickets through the publicist, and he but knew. But you never met him before. He I, I met him twice, but he didn't know who I was. You know, I met him on the street. He, he would walk. I lived in the village. He lived in the village. You'd see Walt Lou Reed walking around the village from time to time, and a couple of times I said stuff, but he didn't know who I was. Because I went and got a record signed by him in college at a, at a record store. I told a story before. He was you just know? shopping there. No, no. He was, he was there to sign the record, oh. and I waited on line. To get, oh, that's amazing. What record was it? Well, I got, I was, uh, well, I got him to sign Transformer, but he was on, but he was on the new, in the new Sensations, uh, uh junket. So he signed Transformer. I got, yeah, I got Transformer, but I got all the Velvet stuff. I got all kinds of, I love no. that guy. All right, so, okay, so. so we went backstage and he was like, he, 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 you know, he just was really nice and we stayed in, uh, stayed in, uh, in touch. You know, I have a. He was nice? What did he say? Oh, yeah. Uh, he just, was very complimentary about the show and my acting, and he was really happy that I came. and And I just said, "Man, I said your your music has always been with me, you know, in my adult life, and has got me through a lot of things." And he gave me a big hug. It was a very big uh, moment for me. And on my wall, my office, I have the last email that I got from him two months before he passed away. And he, he, you know, to me, he was the great American poet of the 20th century. I mean, no I doubt. Really, I mean, him and Ginsburg. I mean, they, when you look at the scope of what he's done over all this time, I mean, he was still so, throughout his, you know, toward, till the end of his life, so creative and still doing new music and just being brilliant. And so New York. So New York's not the same without him. It can't be. No. He, Did you he, go to the uh, funeral or anything? No. I didn't go. The, I was here and, and on the West Coast. I wasn't able to. Did you know he back. was sick? Yeah, yeah. Everyone pretty much knew. I didn't. And then I found out that he had the, the transplant. Yeah, is that what um, happened? Didn't take? Is that what happened? A mutual friend said, "Yeah, he got the transplant. It wasn't so. You know, I got back and you know, I got back in touch with him. And then, you know, that was yeah. But when the night we had the screening of the Hungry Ghost was at the Rubin Museum in New York, which mm. is a Buddhist museum, Tibetan. Buddhist art, and uh, he came, and that was like, that was to me, that was it's, fantastic. It's, but those were that was a generation, like we're we're third generation away from that. But they were around, man. In well, I worked at a place called Cafe Bruxelles on Greenwich Avenue in New York. Yeah, across the street from that place, well, for this is 1988. There was a place called the Rare Book Room. So yeah. one day I walk into the place, and Greg Gregory Corso is in there. Sure, yeah. With the owner, We're, Greg Horse was behind the counter. I don't know if he's working there or what. And then <laughs> Herbert Hunky walks in. Really? And he Peter been, Olofsky. Come on, those guys were all still around in the eighties and nineties. Hunky must be just a little, a little, a little, 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 little tiny ex junkie, huh? Hunky, right when he died, yeah. was living. I was living on the same floor as the Chelsea Hotel as him. He lived on on, on the eighth floor. You lived in the Chelsea Hotel for about a year, and he was on the floor of that and the the. 
the last time I saw him, I helped him in the cab, and he said, someday I'm going to do the same for you. <laughs> and then he, he died a couple of months later. Did you meet Ginsburg, or was he gone? Already? I met him on the street outside uh, St. Mark's Church, outside a poetry reading, got him to sign uh, Kaddish. Uh-huh. How do you pronounce that? Kaddish. Kaddish. Yeah. It's a hell of a... All those guys were around. Great. For years. Yeah, you know? I know, I know. I know. I was, mean that. I mean t- Burroughs was in New York for years. I you never know. met Burroughs. Yeah, I mean, I think he lived down on you know over by CBGB somewhere for a he while. He lived on the Bowery, yeah, the yeah. bunker, and uh, yeah, the, there's um, John Giorno lives in that loft now. He's Still, I think the same place. Yeah, I think he he inherited it or took it over from Burroughs. What? Who turned you on to those guys? At what point? Um, I, I you know who turned him was the guy that I mentioned, Tom Gilroy, who's now a you know, filmmaker. He, yeah. he turned me on the, on the road. When you were like 18, 17? Yeah. I had never even heard of those guys. And then I started reading all the, all the, be- I, I loved And that was your thing. I loved it. Got the you in, right? Beat gets literature. you in. Yeah. Right, because it gets you into New York. It gets you, like, you know, through that portal, you get to Warhol, you get to Lou, you get to everybody in a way. <sighs> yes. Because, that, you know, if you're, if you're compelled creatively along those lines. Right. All of it, like, you know, even the art. I mean, you know, people resist it. They'll fight back against it. But that was it. You know, that, that beat New York is where it was Well, at. the beats gave, really kind of gave birth to the hippie movement. If yeah. But I mean, it all I'm, back, I'm not right? sure that they're happy about it. But, yeah. Well, I mean, look at the influence it had on, on you know, politically and culturally and artistically. Yeah, yeah. I think that, like, the, the pushback against, like, you know, the, the, you know, whatever Eisenhower was doing or whatever. But, like, but between Neil Cassidy and William Burroughs... You know, the, you, you get a lot of things, you know, I mean, you don't get, you don't really get, like, they all seem to have their role. Cause Burroughs is the, the portal to all that heroin right. stuff. I mean, to like, you know, the glorification and, of it, any of it. And then the whole, then there's the Paul Bowles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then, and, yeah. And Geisen, Brian Geisen yeah. doing the dream machine and pretty you know, wild stuff. Do you know, of, they just, did, do you know that they just found this long lost letter? Have you heard about this? Uh-uh. The Joan Anderson letter, which it's called the Joan Anderson letter. So Neil Cassidy wrote Kerouac. A Jones, why, you mean Kerouac's wife? Is it Joan? An- Joan Anderson was a girl that Neil was dating at okay. the time. But he wrote Kerouac a letter. This is before on the road. Yeah, eighteen page letter. Yeah, Kerouac reads this letter, and it basically, you know, that he wrote the town and the city, which was a very mu- more straightforward, more, Thomas, like more, Thomas Wolfe book. Yeah, right, classically yeah. in yeah. style. He read this letter. This yeah. letter basically changed the way. And Kerouac had this epiphany: I'm going to write like this guy. This spontaneous bop prose, right? Which is how Neil wrote letters. Right. Neil was twenty-two, but he was in, un, you know, sure. kind of on a, a reform school. Yeah, right? yeah. But had this incredible literary sense. So Joan had this letter. And, uh, he, they, they call it Joan Anderson letter because he mentions this story of Joan Anderson, a girlfriend I think who wound up in a mental hospital or something like that. Anyway, Kerouac gives it to Ginsburg, and it circulates among the beats, and then it's lost. It's been lost since the fifties. Really. It just resurfaced in the archives of an old, defunct publishing house called the Golden Goose Press. But this one letter really... Was the key. To changing kind of American literature. Sure. It's it's really quite... They thought it fell into, you know, the, the, the Pacific Ocean of uh-huh. near San Francisco, of Sausalito. That was the last time it was seen. Really? It hasn't been seen in 50 years. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's the letter where he's like, all right, well, Neil's not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it's on me. It's pretty wild. Right? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's fascinating that you're, you're you're into this shit because I I mean I love it. I love it. Yeah, no, it was a big big moment in you know in in literature. You know, it's but for you, I mean, you know, I, I think that it sort of informs to me. You know, certainly that movie. You know, the, the search, the the idea of, of searching for either right. you know uh, spiritual truth or poetic truth or artistic truth. I mean, it seemed like you know that's, you're compelled by that. And that, you know, yeah. whatever gift the beat generation gave you, whatever the gift Elaine gave you in understanding that you have that within you, it's sort of what drives you. Yeah. So no. in, in terms of, of struggling with these things, was drugs ever a problem for you? Uh, no, that wasn't a problem for me. But it was problems for a lot of people around me. So you saw the horror of it. But what yeah. about the spiritual search? Where would you land on that? I was brought up Catholic. I got exposed to the Buddhism through through. Jack Kerouac, you know, through reading his stuff in my early teens, but it didn't, I kind of liked the ideas of it, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really ready for it, you know, so 
I started to around this time when I wrote this movie. I was really reading a lot of different kind of spiritual writers, like Gurdjieff and Uspensky and you got Castaneda that stuff? and all that stuff. You can follow well, it. Well, I I liked it a lot, but it didn't really. I could nothing really kind of took hold of me till I started uh, reading Tibetan Buddhism and started go. It would really when I started going to teachings and started seeing you know actual real authentic Tibetan Buddhist teachers. You started going to teachings. Yeah. What does one do there? You just sit there, listen to listen to the teacher to the guy. Yeah, I mean, my teacher is a, a guy named Garchen Rinpoche, who's a Tibetan Buddhist Lama. Who uh, he's in his late seventies now. He spent 20 years in prison in Tibet after the Chinese, you know, occupied Tibet in 1959. And then when he got out of prison, made his way to the West through India. Um, but, uh, you know, like I said, I would read a lot of these books before yeah. I got into Buddhism and, right. and they would make sense and they'd inspire me, but nothing really. After the book was done. Uh, Didn't stick. Didn't stick, but. Through Buddhism, I found a practice that you can, you know, start to work yeah. on a daily basis or some semi-daily basis, yeah. and 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 then then I felt things um, sticking more. Like a meditation practice? Yeah, meditation. Yeah, definitely. What else? Well, reading, reading, you know, texts, and but the the the, the most important thing is to find in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition the. The Lama, the Guru, the, the teacher is of paramount importance, really, mm -hmm. find, and finding the right teacher. All right, so you do meditation, mm -hmm. and the and the 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 I go to the Lama is yeah. of utmost importance. What does that mean? Well, because he's your you know he's your link to the teachings of the Buddha, which is you know right in in and that goes back. His Lama goes back to his Lama. And then, well, why I like the Tibetan tradition is that because of its geographic location its isolation mm. um you know it was isolated for so many centuries that a lot of the teachings kind of you know stayed very yeah uh they stayed in very specific lineages oral lineages from one per one teacher to the next so, mm -hmm. so you know now in the 21st century you you know there's still these teachers alive who like archon rinpoche who you know became a monk in Tibet, you know, before it was occupied by the Chinese. So now, are you in touch with your guy? Yeah, I saw him last week in Arizona. You know, he has a center in Arizona, in the desert, in the mountains. How there. often do you have to check in? Well, I, I, whenever I can. He has a center in uh, L.A., uh -huh. in Arcadia, that he, he teaches there once in a while, and all over the world, actually, uh -huh. in, in Asia. And uh, Europe and Russia. And when you say teachings, when you go, so you read and you teach. What he teaches. I mean, he, on different things, you know. I mean, he'll teach on different aspects of Buddha. I mean, the teachings of the Buddha are very vast. You know, he t the Buddha taught for fifty years. You know, really, there's a, a lot, lot of there, teachings. huh? A lot. Yeah. How does it help you on a day to day basis, outside of being calm or whatever? Like, how does it help you problem solve or move through things? Well, I mean. This is more for other people to say about me who are with me all the time to confirm that it's actually true. In my mind, I'd like to think there's certain things. What did, you know, I mean, for me, it's a lot, you know, something happens and you react to it, right? That's yeah. how, you know. Sure. So practice can give you a moment or a gap to think or pause before you react, right? So mm -hmm. somebody cuts you off, your instinct is to drive by, give the guy the finger, sure. cut him off, right. do something like that. You know, Hi, you get hey. that impulse. Sure. Sometimes. This is just an example, right? You an angry guy? No, no, not necessarily. I'm just right. giving you... I'm no, not, I get This it. is I get not it. even my own example. Okay. It's, an, it's a general example. Okay. Uh, but then you can have a moment where you get the presence of mind that it's like, okay... Is this what I want to do? Is this going to be productive? What, you know, because one of the big tenets and foundations of, you know, Buddhism is karma, right? The yeah. law of cause and effect. Yeah. Every action has a reaction and yeah. those things. Uh -huh. So your action, if you do a very aggressive act, very often the reaction is going to be uh -huh. of aggression. Sure. Yeah, I get it. But, you know, 
um, bef- and I knew these things, but before they only went so far and stayed intellectual, right? When you actually start to, if you, if you are lucky enough to to be around teachers and be around really good, authentic teachers, uh-huh. and develop a practice, then maybe you can be able to. I mean, I'm a student, man. I'm you know kindergarten. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, it's working for you. I, I, I yeah, I find a lot of it's it's a very rich and a lot of wisdom there for me. Yeah, how many years you've been in it? Um funny enough when this this we shot this 2008 this film, then as soon as it was done editing, yeah. in the and uh when the film was edited, one kind of found the teacher, yeah. So 2009ish. Yeah, around so pretty f- 6 years. Pretty recent. 6 years, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good, man. And it doesn't require anything of you financially or promoting wise or you know it's not like a religion it's more of a <laughs> well i mean it doesn't require you to do anything no yeah i mean unless you want to unless right. you feel you know well, yeah you support what are you going to support if you yeah. feel um inspired to do that but it's not no they don't recruit people they don't do any proselytizing they don't go door to door we don't yeah. do any of those things yeah i uh so is that why you screened the movie at the tibetan buddha center yeah because you were, it must have been new. To you. you must by been... then we want you know we we um yeah I forget exactly how that came about but we we thought it would be a cool auspicious it's, place. It's interesting though because like there is something poetic about Buddhism and with your sort of uh, you know your respect for Lou and for poets and for stuff like that. For Lou the... and I did a bunch of fundraisers for Buddha. Lou was in, was a, a, a student of Mingyur Rinpoche, who was another Tibetan Buddhist Lama. Oh, was he? Yeah, for a long time. I don't know. I mean. You know, when you become a Buddhist, you take refuge. That's what it's called when you actually officially, whatever, yeah. become, you take refuge. It's called taking refuge. I'm not, I don't know if he did, but I know he went, he, he studied with Mingyur Rinpoche for a while, yeah. What the... He was involved in the Buddhist community in New York, yeah. And you spent a lot of time with Lou? I didn't spend a lot of time, but the time I spent with him was very precious to me. Yeah. I can't say I spent tons, but I mean... Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, you know... He was a nice guy memorable. to you. He was very generous and kind, yeah. That's sweet. Yeah. So the first, like, when you started uh, getting roles, um, you were like, what, 18, 19? When did no. you play Spider? When did that happen? When I was 23, 22, 23. Were you friends with the kid who played the Leotis uh, brother? What's a, He's a New York Kevin actor. Kevin Corrigan. Yeah, Kevin Corrigan. Yeah. Well, were you we in the met, same crew? I know him now. I mean, we met a little bit after Goodfellas. But I knew his brother... His brother and I worked in a wedding hall in the in the Bronx as waiters. I mean, really? His brother Kenny, yeah. Oddly <laughs> enough. But Kevin's a great actor. I love Kevin. Yeah. I think he's tremendous. I just didn't know if y'all how many of y'all knew each other. I do I know him way back before you know, probably right after Good Friday. You worked in a, a, a wedding hall? Yeah. Just the Italian uh, weddings. When what? When you're high school? Seventeen, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of kids in my neighborhood did. So all right, so you you get this job with Scorsese. What was that? Must oh, have been yeah. amazing. What, so you go yeah. in on a general casting. I went. I had just gotten an a, an agent to, to start. I was. I guess I was twenty two. Yeah, eight, eighty nine, twenty three, and um. So I went to meet the casting director, uh, Julia Taylor, Ellen Lewis, and they said, "Oh, they liked what I did." And they next thing I know was auditioning for him. And uh Were you just blown was your mind blown? Or oh what? yeah. Man, what Italian kid, actor in New York and for him yeah. For Scorsese. And what then was he? I didn't know and then they said De Niro's gonna be in then uh, De Niro's gonna be in the scene with you. I was just like <laughs> you know. It's crazy. It's like all of a sudden you're from, you know, college and then yeah. now you're playing on the Yankees or something. Was, you know, it's crazy. Was he a big influence on you, De Niro? Yeah. Sure. How could he not How be? How could right? he not at that point in time yeah yeah in the 70s and early 80s yeah so all right so they cast you yeah and then like you got to do that thing i had to do that scene oh it was all pretty much all the dialogue was improvised it was different every time and except for the line where he tells the guy to go fuck himself but all that other stuff was all improvised so scorsese said get to go fuck yourself get there basically somehow. said all he said was so the first scene I don't say that. Go fuck yourself in the second scene. The first scene, right. he just said, "Just bring, uh, bring him, a, bring Joe Jimmy a drink." Yeah, yeah. Jimmy was oh, De Niro. Jimmy, yeah, yeah. 
But uh, but what the thing that he did that Scorsese did that was so cool was he said to me when I got there he was like um, treat the actors as the character on and off yeah. set, and that made it kind of easy for me because I was so nervous, you know. Yeah. So I didn't have to relate. So what I did was I told the prop guy I said let me um, take care of the table, which they did. And I set up the bar. Yeah. And then I went up to when dinner came sat down. I went, uh, "What do you want to What do you want to drink, Jimmy?" Yeah. And he was like, <laughs> "Uh, shot of scotch and a glass of water." Yeah. At first he was kind of, and then so I brought him the, th and that's this was not the camera wasn't right, right, right? yeah. So that kind of helped, you know, yeah. just to to kind of be that. He played along with you after. A yeah, beat. oh, he loved it. <laughs> Because yeah. he doesn't want to. He well, the last thing he wants is some young actor start to talk about Mean Streets or something to him. He right. just wants to do his thing. <laughs> yeah, right. He doesn't want. How did you start in the business, Bobby? You know, yeah. he doesn't want to hear that. So you're like a year into acting. So what? No, you... I, by then I was about five, six years. Oh, okay, so... I studied. I'd gone on auditions and auditions for years and never got sh shit for years. I did a play right before that. So where do you? How'd you put together? Because it's a very significant. There are two scenes that are great, but you know they, they, you put together a character. Yeah, well, I started. We started rehearsing. See, the genius of Scorsese. We shot two days, one scene, one day. I mean, you have almost a whole day to do the whole scene. The first hours in the morning are spent just rehearsing. Yeah, improvising. Yeah. Right. So I, I started off, and I was a, a little more, uh, a little bit of a wise ass. And Scorsese said, "You know, maybe it's good if this guy is like a little slow." Right. Like he's not just. So I was like, okay. So I started stuttering, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which made, you know, gave Joe Pesci a lot to work with. Right, right. And that's how that, that and just we just did it different every time. It just like stuttering stuck. Yeah, I guess you know, slow. I was like, well, slow. Am I gonna be like, duh? Yeah, you know, right, what right. Do you want? Right. So I just, I, I don't know. It was just an yeah. instinct. And did he, he like this? Scorsese was like, that's it. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, he just, you know, a good director, somebody like that, he just yeah. makes an atmosphere. Like what I was talking about before, about yeah. you want to create, you want a sense of privacy so yeah. you don't feel inhibited. Right. The worst thing you could have is some asshole yells at you. Yeah. Embarrasses you, makes you feel like scared to create. Right. And then you close up and you just do. Has that happened minimum. to you? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. There's a lot. Of, I mean, more, m more before. You became known. Anybody knew. Yeah. yeah, when, yeah, yeah. when you have a little bit of. Juice in the business people tend to treat you with a little more respect, but when you're young, they take liberties, you know. Yeah. Well, I know you know you've done a, a, a ton of movies, but like you know, it's like, um, but The Sopranos, like I can't imagine. Like, did you have any idea it was going to go for as long? No, 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 not at the beginning. No. Did you, you know, know James before? No, I knew almost everybody else, but not him. Did I you didn't even know his work. No. No. It wasn't a lot. There wasn't a ton of it. Done, he'd done a lot of plays. Yeah. He'd Broadway. Yeah. Did you become friends with him? Oh, yeah. So right off the right yeah. off the bat. Oh, yeah? One of our first scenes, I was driving him, and I think it's the it's the pilot. It's it's in the pilot. And we chase some guy. He's running down the sidewalk, and we chase him with the car and stuff like that. And now, I didn't really know how to drive. I didn't tell anybody that. I had to back down the sidewalk yeah. <laughs> with extras running around. <laughs> and I did it like five. On the fifth take, I smashed the Lexus into the yeah. tree. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, my God, they're going to fire me. Yeah. You know, it's like my second day. Right. This guy's the star. He must think I'm an idiot. He just looked at me. He said, you don't know how to drive. Do you? <laughs> I said, no. And he just started laughing. <laughs> and uh, from then on, it was always, he, he was a good, really good guy. Yeah. Really good friend. That was so sad. Oh, it's terrible. It was just terrible. It was just, I, I, it was just shocking. You know, the people go and you're like, how, how does it? You know, you know the, certain people are just like these forces in the world, and you're like, what? Now it's just gone. Yeah, that was shocking. It right, was really shocking. Yeah. So very young, fifty two, was a young young guy. Yeah, I, I guess he wasn't that healthy. Yeah, but you know, I know people who were less healthy who. Live Keep forever. going. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be honest. You know, I mean, a lot yeah, of people right. say, "Well, he didn't take care of." His. I said, "You know what? A lot of people don't take care of themselves." It's a genetic roll of the know. dice. You, you know, you who, knows? who the fuck knows? I man. mean, I saw him two weeks before he died. He looked great. He looked happy. He looked chill. He was cool. Well, I'm glad that he was happy. Yeah. 
So you, how many, you did how many seasons? Like I did seven. I fucking, like, I don't know what it was like to be on that show, but like the experience of like looking forward to that fucking show, you know, every Sunday was yeah. great. Yeah, it was a good, it was, there was nothing like it. It's very exciting. There's nothing like it. For, for, to be a part of it was very exciting in that respect. Now to yeah. do the, to do, to play a junkie. You know, I mean, what, no. what were you? What was your sense memory on that? What were you leaning on on that? <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you make it whatever you want. You know, whatever you well, think. Well, is you know, get you're in you New York. Know. We all try something. You try. Yeah. You, know, you know, you know what you're doing. But, yeah. uh, but you know that it was it was a it was an interesting character. Oh, it was a lot of fun to play because he 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 went all over the place. Well, yeah, obviously he's a screenwriter, then he's a yeah. dope fiend. But he tried really hard, which yeah. I really liked about him. You know, everybody talks, uh, I got an idea for a movie, we should do this movie, but he actually went and wrote, the, you know, he, right. he really kind of, he he had a lot of, uh, you know, heart that way. I, I, liked I admired it. that about him. I liked that there was a sort of, uh, there, there's a weird, innocent sort of uh, striving to him. Yeah. But on the other side, he's just a fucking killer. Yes, and a nut, and a, and a jerk, and a, all those things. But but the, it made it very very fun to play. That's great. Do you look back? I mean, is it nothing but good feelings about that whole situation? Oh yeah. Even even if it, you know, for the rest of your life, if Christopher is going to be, you're going to be that guy. Ah, what do you? I don't have control over that. I mean, it, uh, I mean, at least it's something that's. I stand behind, you know what I mean? It's an amazing thing. Did you guys do, like, uh, I didn't, wasn't there, I was wondering about, like, how, like, didn't they do all kinds of, like, uh, like, other stuff, like lunch boxes and shit? Did you guys, did you guys get, like, they did part pinball of that? machines? Yeah, pinball machines. And, like, um, not much of that. No? <laughs> no, I wasn't in my deal. It's wild. Not much of those things, yeah. I wonder how, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So, all right, so you had a bar for how long? Well, my wife had a bar when I met her. Oh, okay. So then I kind of worked with her there for a while, and my brother worked there, and my best friend worked there. And was it was, how long? It was that? really small. Oh, okay. Really small bar, little lounge in Chelsea. Yeah. What was it called? Ciel Rouge. Yeah. How then long was we that? We built after? a theater after that. <laughs> and how long you run the theater? We had the theater for about seven years. That's a pretty good run. What was the plan? Did it, did you crap out or what? What happened was, well, it was a not for profit, right? So right. it was all. Uh, we did fundraisers and yeah. we did donations, but then in 2008, then the economy collapsed. We lost all our corporate funding, oh. and it became impossible. So no. that was the thing. So you've done a lot of bit, a lot of big parts, small parts, all kinds of movie parts. What was the, what was the Content Floss movie? That was a Mexican film. Yeah, that came out this summer, and I played Mike Todd. Uh -huh. Mike Todd was a producer of Around the World in 80 Days. Uh-huh. Cantin Floss was the biggest star in the Spanish-speaking world, Mexico, yeah. Yeah. and all over, wherever they speak Spanish, and he starred in that movie. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. They called me up and said, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, I went to Mexico City and shot the movie. <laughs> it was great. How'd the movie do? I, it did, you know, when it opened, believe it or not, because it wasn't meant for for it was it was a, Lat a Latino film. Yeah, but this you know in America there's lots of Latinos. No, no, I know that. So but the, I mean, the, like the I didn't it, know anything the about it. The week it opened, it had the it was highest. All Spanish speaking, right? Not my stuff was all in right. English. It had a lot of English, but yeah. mostly Spanish. But the week it opened, it was the highest gross per screen. So it didn't. It only opened on like three hundred screens, but those because. All the yeah, he's very beloved. Even in yeah. in America, they sure. still watch his movies. You know? Yeah, people of the how do you say Cantin Floss? Is that Cantin Floss? Cantin Floss means barfly. Basically. Yeah, he was uh, he was one of the great uh, Mexican clowns. Yeah. So what do you what do you got going now? I know you've done a lot of TV shows here and there, this and that. Had some good parts in movies. I did a pilot for Amazon called Mad Dogs that they're gonna. Amazon airs their pilots and then decides whether they want to do... It's a very different yeah. model. Then they decide whether yeah. they want to do it or not. It's um, kind of like Deliverance meets The Hangover. Comedy, I'm guessing. Dark comedy. It's yeah, a lot of dark shit. It's, it's you know? very dark, yeah. And it's uh, Ben Chaplin, Steve Zahn, Billy Zane is in the pilot, uh... That sounds exciting. Romney Malco. Yeah, it was cool. And I saw you, when, what was that movie you played the cop in? The the one with the, the Peter Jackson movie? Oh, The Lovely Bones. Yeah, that was an interesting movie. Yeah, that was fun. 
Yeah. That was really fun. What about directing a movie and writing one again? Um, I'm writing something now that I hope I'll direct at some point, but um, I'm working on a project uh, as a writer right now um, that it's not kind of finalized, so I can't really talk about right. it, but it's it's adapting a, a really cool movie from the early 90s, a cool cult movie yeah. to a series, yeah. Oh, but I'll cool. let you know when it's fine. Is it your idea to do it? No, somebody it? approached me to work on it. Yeah, That's producer great, man. and another writer. Yeah. So you're busy. I'm always busy, you know. I mean, I, I, you know, I keep myself busy. Good, man. It was great talking to you. I appreciate it. Thank you, you for having me. It was really, really fun. That was you never get to talk like this. It was awesome. And, uh, and best of luck with everything. And tell your kid, uh, what can I give him? Let's get, let's, let's send you home with something. Oh. Thank you, man. That, the, that he might enjoy. I wonder what I have. I'll, I'll find something. Nice right, talking to you, man. Thanks. That's our show. Isn't it great to hear from Michael? I love that guy. It's great to hear from that guy. Great to talk to him. What have I got here? Like, I, I went and bought something. I was on Twitter. And, um, you know, I follow Sennheiser, the Mike place. They had a mic, like, like they just had a, this guitar amp mic. Like, a, it's just this little mic you put in, your, in front of your guitar amp. I think it's like a 906 or something. And I'm like, I need one of those because, like, God knows I'm a professional musician out here in my garage. But um, but it's just a, it's specifically for this. JustCoffee.coop, available at WTFPod.com. <laughs> That is um, it's a fairly tuned up Stratocaster, um, in in a just a old style, very basic, crybaby wah wah paddle, like I used to have when I was in high school, but didn't really know how to use it. I don't think I know how to use it right now. <laughs> Wow, 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 wow,